Good morning. Welcome to Hope Community Church. Would you please stand and worship with us?
you pray with me? Father God, you are so good. We are so thankful just to be here as your church, to come together and worship and um, indulge in your word this morning, Father. Um, I pray, Lord, for everyone in this room, God, that they would just feel your goodness in their life today. Um, bless them, keep them. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and uh, say hi to a stranger this morning. Hi, <laughs> Cameron. Good morning, Hannah. Well, good morning. I'm glad you've said hello to a stranger or maybe somebody that you know. Um, it's good to, uh, good to say hi to each other and welcome each other. So uh, again, welcome to Hope Community Church, especially for those of you who maybe are fairly new. I want to just let you know that right after this service, uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to meet others right out here in classroom three. It's a newcomer gathering. You'll, you'll get to meet leaders and just different people from the church as well as others that are fairly new. So we just invite you to, to stop in and, and to do that right after uh, this service. And then um, just to direct you to uh, the church website for those of you who are fairly new. Um, you know, if you have your phone and you want to go there right now, feel free to do that. And you can uh, just sign up for the e-newsletter. It's a good way to know what's going on uh, throughout the week. And then um, you can sign up to uh, download the church app. So that's different than, of course, the church website. But again, it's another tool, and there's all kinds of things in there that could be helpful to you as you navigate um, getting connected here at Hope Community Church. A couple of uh, things to uh, draw to our attention and, and make us aware of, and that is um, the, uh, the fall is soon upon us, and with the fall coming is uh, the startup of many new things in ministry. Um, and we have the opportunity on Wednesday evenings to invest in kids around God's Word. Uh, so we, we have a ministry called uh, Awana. It's the Awana program connected with uh, the international Awana ministry. And it takes a bunch of adults to make this happen. Um, so if you, if you like kids, if you love kids, if you want to invest in kids, if you want to see kids be able to... Uh, to, to grow and learn God's Word, then we invite you to, uh, to sign up. Uh, there's a table out in the lobby right after the service. You can stop out there and talk to somebody, and they'd be glad to answer your questions and help you to get connected in that ministry. And then um, last week, uh, Pastor Joe had mentioned uh, that he will begin a Bible study on Monday evenings through the book of Ephesians. Many, many of you have signed up already for that. There's still room for more. Um, so again, it's 7 p.m. Uh, on Monday evenings right here in Classroom 1 and 2. If you'd like to get to know other people as well as reading God's Word together and learning together, that'd be a great opportunity, a great place for you to do that. And then the last thing I just want to alert your attention to, and that is um, August 29th, which is in two weeks, is going to be a different Sunday. Okay? It's going to be different, um, and it's going to be fun. So I just want to let you know that. I'm not going to tell you all the details about it. You're just going to have to come to find out what that is. And actually, we're going to ask some of you that attend this service to think about coming to the second service just because of some of the things that we're going to be doing. It would be helpful to have some of you at the second service because the second service isn't quite as large as the first service. So if um, you don't have kids and maybe you could think of that, um, that would be Great. Um, so now the rumors will begin as to what is happening on the 29th. Again, you're not going to want to miss it. There's going to be some really good things, um, some, even some tasty things. So uh, kids, you can head to your class downstairs, sixth grade and under. Miss Becky is leading the troops out right now. We thank all of you parents and um, teenagers who invest each Sunday in our kids. It's um, so good to have so many young people, a part of our church, being introduced to Jesus and learning to follow after him. And um, we thank all of you who invest each week in that. Would you pray with me before we jump into God's word? God, um, we, have, we have addressed you in song and in word this morning 
with so many important thoughts. We have invited you, Holy Spirit, to be present with us in this space. You're always here. But we've invited you to come and be here. And we ask that you would move and speak in our hearts. We've been reminded that you are a great God who doesn't want uh, people to be separate from him, but to be in relationship. And that you've given us an identity, a new identity. We can look at ourselves and view ourselves through the truth of what it is that you declare over us when we come into relationship with Jesus, that we are a child of God. We thank you for being adopted into your kingdom, to having a new last name, to having brothers and sisters who are also identified in Christ. We thank you for what that transformation is producing in the way that we think and then in the way that we live our lives. And then finally, God, we declared that you are good and that your goodness is continuously, it is constantly chasing after us. Your goodness is running after us. Oh, we want to experience more and more and more of your goodness. And this morning, as we jump into the reality of living in a world that is not good and that is full of brokenness, we ask that you would give us eyes to see your word, a heart to receive your word, an ability to understand what it means that your goodness is running after us while we live in an evil and broken place. And so we, we worship you, we acknowledge we need you, we acknowledge that you do and are doing good things in our lives. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So you may um, remember that song, it was popularized back in the 1950s. Made it to the top of the Billboard charts, actually. Made its way into several movies. And maybe you sang it in Sunday school many years ago. That song is, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. I don't sing on the worship team. You see why? <laughs> right? He's got the whole world in his hands. And who's the he? It's, it's God, right? That's the implication. It's God. God has the whole world, the whole wide world in his hands. I can remember um, getting a little bit older and being in middle school and this, this song of, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big. Remember, screaming that out as a kid. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And then as I progressed into high school, I can remember the, this very popular hymn, How Great Thou Art, right? Then sings my soul. I'm not even trying to sing that one. Maybe we could have Scott sing it. Boy, I bet that would be awesome. He's got an amazing voice. Then sings my soul, right? My Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Art. Oh, and I can remember in high school reading the Old Testament stories and being enamored with the greatness of God. Oh man, the stories in, in Exodus. The nation comes to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and, and they meet with God there, and the mountain is shaking and there's billowing smoke and fire comes down, and they're just terrified. I can remember thinking about that as a as a high schooler, 16, 17 year olds, and just thinking about how big is God? He's Huge, he's amazing. And oh, how to be near him, to know him, to have him involved in my life. And then as I progressed into my college days, I can remember singing the song, God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom. Dumb power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. 
You know, these songs, and there's one that we sang this morning, right? His goodness is running after us, and how God is so big, and yet he's so personal. There's this, there's this verse in Isaiah 49 that says, he has our names written on our hands. The palm of his hands, he's written our name. And we sang that song, right? Where our identity is in Jesus, it's in Christ. What he, what he, what he calls us and, and we're deeply connected to him. And these truths provide so much comfort, so much help. Until something difficult happens in life. And then when those difficult things happen in life, we begin to wonder how good God really, really is. And now suddenly those songs that we sang that provided so much comfort provide no comfort at all anymore because the circumstances that we are now encountering and we're living with seem so overwhelming, so discouraging, so hurtful. We feel abandoned, left alone. It's the marriage that you're in in this thing and you, you said before a whole bunch of pe- people and in front of God that till death do his part, you would pursue oneness and, and you've been at it and oneness is not there. Intimacy is just not in the relationship. And rather than intimacy, there is a growing apart. And you live in the same home, but you don't live life at all together. Where's God in that? You have a son or a daughter who has decided to make decisions and choices and go in a different direction, bringing all kinds of hurt and pain in their life and in those around them. Alcohol, drugs, seeps into somebody's life, somebody who's close to you, a friend, a family member, perhaps, and with that comes destruction, bad things. And you're wondering, where is the goodness of God now, and how is it that we rest in his hands? There seems to be no comfort anymore from those things, and then it's the diagnosis of cancer, and there are several within our congregation who have this diagnosis, and they are battling cancer right now. And then it's the death of someone close. And it feels so good, it feels so good to sing those songs when you were a kid that he's got the whole world in his hands, and my God is so big, so powerful. There's there's comfort then, but not anymore. Not anymore. And so we ask ourselves these big questions. Where is God in all of this? You know, I know this feeling all too well. I can remember, well, I'll just start with last week. (laughs) I've got a beehive that's outside. And I've been trying to take care of these yellow jackets. I've got stung five different times over a couple of different days. So it was like a sting here, a sting there. One day it was twice, one in this finger and one in that finger. And that night as I went to bed, my finger was swollen, my hands were swollen and tingly. It felt like it was all numb. Kind of wondered, was it going to end up in the ER? Was I going to get some kind of crazy reaction? Where's God in those times, right? I can remember in college, First day on campus, before other freshmen arrive, and I'm playing soccer, I'm trying out for the soccer team. Three hours into the day, I think I have a good shot of making the team. At least the coach afterwards tells me so. Blow out my ACL. College career done. The next year, high school, or next year, college sophomore, in a car with friends, hit head on by a drunk driver. Where is God in those times? Married, few children, October of 2017, two and a half year old son or two and a half year old son Luke is diagnosed with leukemia. Where is God in that time? Where, how does he have us in his hands? March 17th, 2002, he dies. 
God is so big. God is so powerful. He has our names written on the palm of his hands. But where is he in all these hard things? If you ever asked that question, if you ever struggled with that, if, if you currently are living through really difficult time of some kind, you're not alone in those questions. You're not alone in those feelings. The teacher 3,000 years ago addressed them. He asked them. He was dealing with them as well. He observed them in people's lives. So this past summer, we've been reading through the book of Ecclesiastes. The title, just sim- the name just simply means teacher. He's the teacher. He's the one with the most wisdom. He sits in the position of being king. He has the money, the wealth, the position, and the power to research and study and to investigate everything in life. And he goes after all kinds of things. And today we're going to look at how he addresses the answers that we're chasing when we're in hard times. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Consider what God has done and who can straighten what it is that he has made crooked. When times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, a righteous man perishing in his righteousness and a wicked man living very long in his wickedness. Do not be overrighteous, neither be overwise. Why destroy yourself? And do not be overwicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? Oh, it is so good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. In these six verses, Solomon is addressing one of the most complex questions that we face as human beings. People forever and always have been asking this question, trying to understand how the goodness of God can run after us, how we can be, so to speak, written be in the palm of his hands with our names written there for him to be so intimately interested in us and so powerful that he can protect us that we're protected in the palm of his hands and yet experience these difficult things. And so we ask, why do bad things happen? And we do begin to wonder, is there a way to prevent them from happening? And people go after ways of preventing those bad things from happening in their life. And you know, when you pause and you really think about it, any philosophy of life, any philosophy of life, any religion that has been constructed, all goes after this issue. Because nobody likes to have bad things in their life. Who likes to hurt? Nobody, right? And so as people, we, we, we construct ways to solve that problem or ways to keep that at bay, ways to prevent it from happening to us. And so, oh, you can go, you know, it's fun, go back and read the Greek mythologies, right? And, and the Greeks' view of life on earth and the gods who rule and reign above and the evil wickedness that they would do to men but also do to each other and They had all kinds of crazy ideas about how to appease those gods and make those gods happy, and in particular certain ones, so as to benefit themselves. I mean, you pick any major religion of today. Pick anyone. Every one of them attempts to address the reality that there's a whole bunch of evil that happens in our world. We're trying to solve it. We're trying to come up with a way to keep it at bay. We're trying to make some understanding of it as we live with the hurt and pain in our life. 
And here, Solomon, the teacher, addresses this issue. And he comes at it with four kind of statements, four kinds of teaching to help us understand what all is going on. And those statements are this. Number one, bad things happen that are out of our control. There's just stuff that happens that's out of our control. Secondly, he says, those bad things that happen to us, they're not necessarily punishment. They're not necessarily the gods up there who are mad at us. Third, he says, beware of the wrong efforts. So this is where we get involved and we try to appease the gods that can prevent bad things from happening. And then finally, he says, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a right way to respond. The best response is to have a balanced approach and to fear God. So we're going to work through each of these verses and we're going to see how he dresses this situation. But beginning in verse 13, consider what God has done. Squarely. Squarely, the blame or the responsibility is placed upon God. When these difficult things happen, God is the one that the teacher said is the one who maintains responsibility for it. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he's made crooked? You take a piece of steel, (laughs) A piece of steel that's been heated to 1,800 degrees in the, in the furnace, right? And it's then bent, bent into a circle. <laughs> take, your, take your tire rim and try to straighten that out and make it into a nice, straight piece of something flat. Go ahead and try and do it. Take your pair of pliers and, and pull and stretch at it. Take a hammer and try and beat it, right? Do all you can to try and straighten out something that's crooked. Well, it's impossible, right? We can't do that. We can't straighten things that are crooked. And what we're seeing here is there's bad things that happen that are out of our control. We can't do this. God is squarely the one who's, who's responsible for this. And you can't change it. You don't have the power to. You're not big enough and strong enough to be able to straighten out the evil that's taking place in your life. You just can't control that. Now, a couple things about this statement. First, uh, we, we need to understand that this isn't a moral statement about God. It's, 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 it's not that, that, that the teacher is saying that somehow God is the one who's doing these evil things and that God is somehow this bad guy like the Greek mythology gods. God is not like that. God is is good. God is righteous. God is pure. God is perfect. God is everything that is in opposition to darkness and evil. John tells us in 1 John, in him there's no darkness. No, no darkness at all. All throughout Scripture, we are are, are formed and taught and instructed that God is righteous. He is pure. He is good. And so while we experience these evils in our life, these bads in our life, these things that make our life miserable and difficult, the theological way to look at it is that God does not commit this evil, but God does permit the evil in my life. God doesn't commit it because God can't commit it. God is righteous. He's holy, he's good, but he does permit it. And what the teacher is emphasizing in this is that God is sovereign. He's in control over all the events, over the good and the bad, over the righteous and the unrighteous, over the holy and the wicked. He has the whole world in his hands. He's big, he's strong, he's almighty, It doesn't take him by surprise. He's got both the good and the bad. And you and I cannot straighten out the crookedness that he permits to be in our lives. Which is an important lesson for us. Because oh, how we want to straighten out the crookedness. But what we got to remember is he's the one who can straighten the crookedness. He's the one who can make it straight. 
right? But we fall into this trap of thinking that, well, somehow we can, right? But it's important for us to remember that we cannot change the heart of our spouse to bring intimacy into the relationship. We cannot change the heart of our son or our daughter who is going the direction that he or she is choosing to go. We cannot straighten out the drinking habits, the the drug habits of those in our life who are bringing destruction into their lives. We cannot make the cancer go away in and of ourselves. We cannot straighten out what is broken. We do not have authority over the evil in our lives. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to do something about it. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that we we shouldn't have conversations. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue intimacy. It doesn't mean we shouldn't sit down with our kids and have the conversation to point out what is righteous and what is evil. It doesn't mean we shouldn't go to doctors and seek their wisdom and their assistance and their help. No, we should do those things. But what it does mean is we cannot be in this place where we are getting angry at God and attempting to manipulate him into doing what it is that we want him to do. Because only he, and when he chooses, only he can make that which is crooked straight. Therefore, his encouragement is for us to just kind of recognize That there's good times and there's bad times, and when the times are good, be happy, and when times are bad, it's bad. It is bad, and it hurts, and we feel alone, and it's appropriate to express our emotions and to express the feeling of being let down by God. But to remember, we're still in his hands. We're still in his hands. You know, this all then leads to that second point and the way that people, you know, we begin to think and, and, and sometimes we start to think that, well, you know, if, if I was a good person, if I was, if I was a righteous person, then good things are going to happen to me, right? And it's the bad people. It's the, it's the people who make bad choices. It's the, it's the people who, who, who really have evil intent to, who have evil that happen to them. And that's a, that's a very common thought. It's a very common thought to think that way. But the teacher says, um, wait a minute. I looked around and I've observed a few things. Verse 15, in this meaningless life of mine, I've seen both of these. A righteous man perishing in his righteousness and a wicked man living long in his wickedness. It's interesting, you have a righteous man, you have a wicked man. You have a righteous man who lives shortly, dies, even though he's a good man, producing good, bringing good. You have a unrighteous man, a wicked man, who produces evil and wickedness, and he keeps on living. And the teacher's like, isn't that crazy? A righteous guy, a guy who's guy who's investing in people and bringing good into into this planet, into our culture, and he dies young. He goes out and he's just driving to work and he gets hit in a car accident and dies at 30. But then you got this other guy who is his friend who, who's going this direction, the opposite direction, is living an evil and wicked life and brings all kinds of damage to the relationships in his life and blows things up at work and destroys his family. He's a horrible father and he lives till he's 85. And just lives a life of recklessness. And the teacher says, there's a guy over here who loved Jesus with all of his heart and was serving him and doing good and bringing good to be here. And he dies at 30. And this guy lives to 85. And that doesn't make sense to us, right? And we go, huh, come on, this doesn't make sense. It's the good, right? It's the good guys. Well, that's the way it always goes in the movies, right? I mean, all the Marvel movies, right? You know, uh, yeah, it's rough, it's tense, it's hard, the bad, you know, the, the evil guys are beating up on the good guys, but the good guys, they always come out in the end, and they win. Good always wins. All the movies, good always wins. No, that's not the way it really works, but that's the way we think. This is the way that a lot of people think, and he even goes back and, well, well here, here you go, here's an example, Job. For those of you who are right now in this place, deep, deep, deep in this place of wondering how it is that God has you in his hand, I encourage you to read the book of Job. 
I read through the book of Job several times after my son was diagnosed and after his death. It was incredibly helpful. But you know, there's some really stupid things, and that's one of the things that was helpful about reading it. It's learning the stupid things are the things that people believe. One of Job's friends said to him, Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished. How is it that the innocent people perish? How is it that the, that the, that the, that the righteous would ever die, right? Where were, or where, where were the upright ever destroyed? Tell me a, just tell me a story of when, when the, the righteous was destroyed. No, no way. He says, as I've observed, those who plow evil, those who sow trouble, they reap it. And the breath of God, at the breath of God, they are destroyed. At the blast of his anger, they perish. And there, there, there it is, there it is. That's the thinking, right? Good guys win, bad guys lose. Do good things. You make God happy. Your life is good. Not too long after my son's, my son's diagnosis with leukemia, I had a young adult come to me and say, Pastor Kirk, I don't get this. Like, I, don't, I don't understand. How is it that you as a pastor are having a son get sick with leukemia? Like, how is it that you as a pastor, you who, who apparently loves God, seemingly loves God, I mean, that's what you do, that's your job, right, is to teach people about Jesus and introduce them to him. How is it that you as a pastor who, who loves God and invests in following after him and invests in helping others follow after him, how is it you, that you who's invested your entire life in this could have a son get sick with cancer? Wow, question. And what is it that the, that the young adult was saying? Like, good guys? Well, good guys have good things happen to them. Bad guys, that, that, that shouldn't happen to you, Pastor Kirk. That should happen to my crazy boss at work who's just, you know, this and that and all kinds of stuff. But the teacher says, ah, oh, no. That's, that's just, that's wrong thinking. It's the wrong way to... To, to look at why there's good and there's bad. It's not that God is necessarily punishing you because of something that you have done. No. 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 Stuff in life happens. And it's not necessarily because I'm righteous or wicked. But this then leads to Solomon to address another part of that. So we're, we, we live with this thought that the good guys win because they do good. And, and Solomon, he goes on to kind of dig into that a little bit more. And he says, don't, don't, don't be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? And don't be over-wicked and don't be a fool. Why die before your time? And it's interesting, again, he, he, he puts the parallels together. Don't be over-righteous and don't be over-wise. And he's paralleling that to don't be over wicked, right? And, and don't be a fool. So, so they're the same in that over righteous and over wise and over wicked and over foolish, right? And they have the same result, though. People who are overly righteous and overly wise destroy themselves. Those who are overly wicked destroy themselves. So it's the same outcome, right? And what is he getting at here? What he's pointing out is that sometimes we can think that I can do enough righteous things to make God like me and stay on my side. Or if I've come to the conclusion that there really is no God, because again, like there's all kinds of philosophies in life and we're all trying to figure out how to deal with the, the discomforts and the hard things in life. And so one, one viewpoint is the humanist viewpoint the atheist viewpoint, which just says, let's get rid of God. We don't have to deal with him. And guess what? Now without God, yeah, there's bad things that happen, but go ahead and do whatever it is you want in life. Feel free to live it up. Live it up however you want. Which ends up with us doing a lot of things, if we're in charge and deciding, then we end up doing a lot of wicked things, evil things, Scripture points out, is destructive to us. And so whatever your philosophy is in life, and however you may perceive God, we can be over wicked or we can be over righteous, and both of them take us to the same outcome. It destroys us. It doesn't work. 
It doesn't solve the issue in any way at all. Now, to just kind of parse some of this a little bit, dig into it a little bit, when he says, don't be overrighteous, you're like, well, what does that mean? Don't be overrighteous. Well, first, let's talk about what it can't mean. It can't mean that you can be overly righteous. <laughs> like, because righteous is righteous. It's like 10 is 10 is 10. You, it, it, it's just 10. It, it, it's not 9, it's not 8, it's not 11. It's, that's what it is. And, and, and so righteousness is righteousness is righteousness. Righteousness is the perfection. It's the way that we want everything to be. It is that what is right. right? So you can't be over-righteous. And you can't be overly wise because wisdom is wisdom is wisdom is wisdom. And foolishness is foolishness is foolishness, right? And so it, and it can't mean overly wicked, like wicked is wickedness, and that's what wickedness is. It just means that you can't be extreme. As one commentator explains it, he says, there are no privileged claims in life on the side of either wisdom or folly, of either justice or wickedness. Neither of them allows a person to be secure or protected from bad things happening to them. These contradictory experiences of life, overly righteous and overly wicked, right, they testify to the failure of humans' efforts. And so there we are, trying to get God on our side or blowing God off as though he doesn't exist, and both attempting to be overly righteous and overly wicked produce nothing of value. And so the teacher says, look, after looking at all of this, how do we come to any kind of conclusion about it? And then he just simply says, it's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. So the best response, the best response to this whole dilemma, right, the best response to bad things is to have a balanced response. Uh, this word extreme, it, it's, it's, it can be translated in so many ways. It, it has this idea of going out or spreading out or coming out. So the New American Standard translates this as comes forth with both of them. Uh, the man who fears God comes forth with both of them. Or the New King James, the man who fears God escapes them all. Or the message, uh, the man who fears God deals responsibly with all of reality and not just a piece of it. He ends by saying, that we need to fear God. The man who fears God has a balanced response to this crazy situation and question that we're dealing with. The man who fears God. I think I learned this in 2005. So I mentioned in 2000, my son was diagnosed with cancer. In 2002 of March, he died. 2000, it was 2004 or 5. I was going fishing with a friend. We had our two boys, 12 years old at the time. We're in a truck, a pickup truck. I've never been to this place where we're going. We're driving down the mountainous roads up above 80 in the middle, really, of nowhere. I think it's Route 44 that we're on. And, and the roads are, are, are windy, and we're descending a hill. And as we're descending the hill, I can see off in the distance that the road like, doesn't keep going, which must mean the road turns. And we're going down the hill, and I think the speed limit is 45 miles an hour. And Keith, who is driving, 
began to go faster than 45 miles an hour, which, you know, not too bad. I don't mind that. And, um, but we keep accelerating, and the turn gets closer and closer. And again, I've never been on this road. And all I can see in front of me is trees and a guide rail. And I'm, and, and I'm in the passenger seat. Somebody else is driving the vehicle. And I said, Keith, you're going to slow down. I, that's how uncomfortable I got. I mean, for you, know, for you to be a passenger and to, to, to say something to the driver, it has to be uncomfortable. Keith, you're going to slow down. And instead of slowing down, we continue to accelerate. And again, the only thing I see is trees and a guide rail. And I think probably within about 25 yards, I took over. I reached across the seat, grabbed the steering wheel, and turned it hard. I didn't know what was going to happen. The only thing I could see was us going 45, 55, 60 miles an hour through a guide rail into a woods. Something happened. And when I opened my eyes after a bang, we were in the center of a steel bridge that was a couple hundred yards long. And he's still driving, having a seizure. I am fighting him with the steering wheel, trying to get his leg off of the accelerator so that I can reach across and put the brake on. It took us to get all the way across the bridge before I finally got in that situation and threw the car into park, took the keys out, checked on the boys. They were all okay. And the truck is in the middle of the road. And as I look out the rearview mirror, all of my stuff is strewn across the bridge. And so I get out of the, bri- I get out of the, stu- uh, of the car and go to pick up my stuff. And so I'm picking up my stuff. And as I'm walking along in this sort of really big river, I see, I see my sleeping bag floating down the river. I see my chair floating down the river. I, I lost all my stuff was lost, except my fishing pole, which was good, because we kept going on, and we we were able to keep fishing. I just wore the same clothes the whole time, and I don't know how I stayed warm, but it worked. But as I'm walking across this bridge and picking this stuff up, I can, I, I just remember this as clear as can be, like, how am I alive? How am I not hurt? Especially when I went back down and got all the way across the bridge, and I looked at the road, 25 mile an hour Maybe it said 15 mile an hour. I mean, the curve was a 90 degree turn. How do you go 45, 55, 60 miles an hour into a curve, turn a steering wheel blindly, bounce off the side of the guide rail right into the center of the road? How, and you think about any fraction of a second, any different way, that truck would have hit at any kind of angle. It would have had to have flipped, smash right into the trees. And so I'm thinking about this. I'm like, God, you have me in your hands. You totally have me in the palm of your hands. There's no other explanation. There's no, there's just no other explanation. A millisecond, a milli whatever. I mean, there's no explanation. Yeah, people can say, oh, wow, you're lucky. I mean, how do you get to be lucky on something like that? God, I'm convinced you have me in your hands. And then I kept walking. And I'm like, but what the heck? You know, what about my son? And, and how is it that I'm in your hands then? And why am I alive and he's dead? And, and where are you in that? And then I remember Job. And I've been reading Job. And I remember what God says to Job. So Job is a fascinating book. It's so important to read with these kinds of questions. In chapter 38... God begins to speak to Job. So just so you know, Job is a guy who got sick. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost everything. And he's lying there just sick. His body is aching and pains. He's got boils all over his body trying to figure out why has all this evil happened to me? Why has God made my life so bent and crooked? Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and he said to him, Who is this that darkens my counsel? 
with words without knowledge. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know Job. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. And for four more chapters and 125 verses and probably some 75 different kinds of questions like that, God just keeps going and going and going after Job. Job, I am so big and so strong and almighty. There's nothing I cannot do. That's what he's saying to Job. And when, jo- when, when, when God stopped speaking, this is what Job said. Verse 1 of chapter 42, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plans of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel is without knowledge? Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. And my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. And as I'm walking across the bridge and I'm thinking through all of these things, I'm realizing things are bent. They're crooked. I am not strong enough to make them straight. God has me in his hands. He's never letting me out of his hands. He is big and strong and powerful and nothing is getting past him into my life. And that what I need to do, the only thing that I can do, is to respond with an attitude of fear, of awe. Of look at who God is. I can't figure it out. I can't comprehend it. But I'm going to choose my life. I'm going to choose to live my life in faith that God is big and powerful and he's got all of it. He's got all of it. He's got all of me and everything, no matter, no matter what, no matter how bent, no matter how crooked things are. And I will stand in awe of him. Now, you know, when you go through life and you have all of these hard things in life, you ask all of these hard questions. And it's appropriate. I mean, it's what we do as people. But the, but the biggest mistake that people make is to think that they can manipulate God or to think that God is the one that's evil. You can't manipulate God, and God is not evil. He is only good. He is only righteous. And he loves you no matter the evil that's in your life. He has you. He has you. Don't forget it. His goodness is coming after you. Worship team, would you make your way up? And I'm going to ask, would you guys just lead us in singing that song. I know you're going to do a different one, but would you just lead us in singing that song? Pray with me while the team comes. God, God, help us. Oh, help us, help us, help us. Help us as we, as we struggle through the hard things in life. I pray for the many in our congregation who have upside-down relationships, who have brokenness in their bodies, who are grieving because of those they love who've been lost to death. For those who are just grieving over the loss of job and job transition. For those of us who are dealing with just the mundane pain, small painful things that just become annoyances, flat tires and yellow jackets that sting us and roofs that leak and problems and all the just stuff. And I ask, 
God, I just ask that you would show the goodness of you to us this morning. It's in your name. Pray these things. Amen. Would you please stand and worship with us? you think, oh, what we think about, how we think about things 
matters. So there's not a lot of stuff. Like There's not a lot of things to necessarily go home after this message and go do, right? Other than to think about how you're thinking about the things in life that you're dealing with. Right thinking will produce right living. Hope Community Church, go this morning hopefully encouraged this truth that God is good and his goodness is running after you. Have a great week.